Uh -huh. Hey everyone, Spirit here. In this video, I got the honor of interviewing Chris from Squid Shock. We've talked about his upcoming game releasing soon called Bo, art influences, and so much more. Make sure to wishlist the game on Steam and support the developer. I hope you all enjoy the interview. Hey everyone, my name is Spirit. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Chris. Chris is the creative director, lead artist of Squid Shock Studios. His upcoming game, Bo, will have a playable demo on February 1st, 2021. Bo is a hand-drawn 2.5D adventure platformer in a world of Japanese folklore. If you're a fan of Metroidvania and action-adventure games like Okami, you need to check out the teaser trailer for Bo. Link will be available in the description. So Chris, how are you doing today? Doing good. It's a little bit later here in Thailand. Had one interview earlier today, and so the momentum's going, so this should be a good one too. That's awesome. The rush is there. The excitement, the hype for Bo. The adrenaline and is pumping. Let's let's do it. Let's talk about the game. So do you embrace the fact that people are comparing your game Bo to Okami? Oh, totally. Um, a lot of the comparisons we do get for our game, a lot of the more negative comparisons we get are not, not from Okami, it's from Hollow Knight. We mm -hmm. can talk about that later. Uh, but your question was about Okami, but uh, yeah, a lot of the fandom, there's a lot of crossover uh, between the Okami fans and people who are naturally attracted to Bo. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the similarities are, are definitely there. Uh, the first one being kind of like the overall character design has a similar vibe. I mean, I don't know too much about the Okami character design process, but I imagine that they were uh, heavily inspired by the kitsune masks and the like, uh, Japanese mask making um, with the red markings on white. Bo has the same, it's based off a kitsune mask, which which is, just means fox in Japanese. So like a fox mask, you see them everywhere in Japanese culture uh, or like uh, Japanese media also. Very nice. And then he also has that... Uh, Bo also has the like dial symbol on his forehead. Uh, it, it is similar to the one that's also on, on Okami, so people will draw the comparison naturally. And also because of all the Japanese aesthetics that are involved in our game as well as, as Okami. And I was telling you earlier that I was literally playing Okami <laughs> less than 15 minutes ago, basically. It's very like methodical, like I'll just be staring at one screen uh, for like 10 minutes, kind of like figuring out how, how are they doing this uh, particle system? How do they get the waves to roll in, out, uh, in and out of the coast in this section? Or just admiring like the textures a lot, especially in Okami. It's very nice. Um, I've, I've played uh, Okami recently and the game is beautiful. To have a comparison, to, for people to, have, to make comparisons to that game, and also Hollow Knight is actually like a big compliment. Well, I first want to say like, I feel so unworthy to be even in the same like sentence as those two games <laughs> um the, the comparisons are there but i i will totally accept the fact that i'm not anywhere near that level in my own mind and it and it's totally fine people do different things of different quality and people that doesn't affect people's love for what what those games are the 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 comparisons come, well the hollow knight comparisons come from sort of the overall character design Mm -hmm. It's a character with a mask and a cloak. Uh, so people have been like saying that it's basically a rip -off, a Hollow Knight ripoff. A lot of games are getting these criticisms nowadays because Hollow Knight was just such a runaway hit. It's become ingrained in the minds of, of so many people who just got into indie gaming. And for a lot of people, that is their main exposure to this kind of indie gaming and kind of like a hand-drawn art style. I know that the game Crowsworn, are you familiar with Crowsworn? Uh, no. Uh, what game is that exactly? What kind of uh, game Crossborn is, that? is is a Metroidvania that's in development by Mongoose, Mongoose Rodeo Studios right now. And it got, over the past year, it's just been heavily criticized for being a Hollow Knight ripoff because the art style is quite similar. Hollow Knight has these heavy, heavy uh, outlines, inked outlines, uh, as well as the, the cell shading kind of thing. They, they kind of do an interesting cell shading technique that's halfway between cell shading and like heavy paint stroke kind of photoshopped brushes mm -hmm. which looks beautiful and and they and they do it so consistently and well throughout the game and crowsworn's just been reamed for like kind of taking that from hollow knight at the same time they're they're getting so much praise just for being 
similar to Hollow Knight. Like they get all the Hollow Knight fandom, like just jumping on their game um, and supporting them full heartedly. Um, but at first it wasn't like that. And I think the difference really is, is they're starting to see that the people who are developing that game are serious mm -hmm. and they're putting a lot of work into the game. And at that point, can you really say it's a ripoff if you are trying to make something of really good quality? It's less of a cash grab or like trying to ride the coattails type thing. So the point of all that is like, I'm really trying to putting like my full effort into this game. I'm trying to uh, really make something that's, that people will think is worth playing. Uh, while the criticisms of like uh, the similarities between my game and other games can sometimes be jarring to especially new developers, after a while, I just see it as like only good. It's an only, it's only a good thing. The Hollow Knight community is very dedicated. You know, they they love this genre of gaming and just having people talk about Bo in that kind of way, even though it's critical. You know, people like to be their own critics. Not saying not saying the the amount of feedback should be like that all the time, but uh, the fact that people are talking, it's good publicity as well. I would say honestly, the word ripoff is very harsh. It really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even like using it because I don't agree with those statements. People don't realize this. Every game comes on the back, is standing on the shoulders of every game that came before it in some way, shape, or form. The word ripoff is kind of an ignorant term. Mm -hmm. Um. I would say inspired that, by. Yeah, exactly. It's it's all about inspiration. And even, even you know, Hall and I definitely took, you can listen to interviews or whatever from Team Cherry and they they sourced from so many games. I mean, have you ever heard of a game called Super Metroid? Like, hell yeah. Hey, you know, <laughs> um, they have a whole genre named after them. So uh, at what point the whole copying versus not copying is like a whole philosophical discussion that you could go into, but. Um, I, I don't mind it anymore, you know. I really don't. They care in some capacity, so. They do care. They, that's 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 yeah. the main point, that they care enough to comment on it. Once they get their hands on the demo for Bo, I think people might have a different perspective on the game and maybe change their thoughts, uh, their initial thoughts about what they said earlier about Bo. And and I, I talk about these negative comments, but the overwhelming majority has been positive. Yeah. But unfortunately, those negative ones like are little demons that live in your head and always are just gnawing at you. Like, Yeah, it definitely um, it gets the best of us. It really does. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you experience it too as a YouTuber. Like, it's, yeah. it's unavoidable. People people will find anything to hate on. It's crazy. Uh, but, but I am a super appreciative to everyone who's positive. It's like, that's also what keeps me going uh, big yeah. time. That's a, yeah, definitely. Positivity is the way. Uh, it, it's the drive that will keep us going and doing the things that we love. You know, we can't let negative uh, take us down, diminish us because we're human beings. We need to we need to feed on positive energy and, and continue yeah. our lives. And yes, uh, I've had people on my YouTube channel troll me and tell me very nasty things. One person in particular said, I'm too old for this. I'm like, OK, whatever. I'm going to keep going. You can keep hating. <laughs> don't read the comments. <laughs> yeah. I do read the comments, but, you know, don't let them affect you is really Very my true. Mantra. Words to live by. Words definitely to live by. So uh, on Steam, there's over a thousand players that have wishlisted the game. I just want to know, what's your feedback on, on that? It's interesting. When we first launched the Steam page, we got a flood of... Uh... A flood of a lot of wish lists. I don't know where those came from because at that time we barely had even, we had screenshots. That's about it. We had no video. Uh, there wasn't much information about the game. I think a lot of people are like just wish listing every Metroidvania that comes up because mm -hmm. they're Metroidvania heads, and it's been steadily growing after that first spike for a while with with some significant spikes here and there based on like the trailer we launched last week. There was a, a bigger spike there. I don't. I honestly don't really know where our number should be at this point in time, mm -hmm. but I'm like, you know, the first time, the first few days where like people were actually wishlisting the game, I was like, oh, there this you is, go. This is, yeah, this is awesome. I hope the numbers grow. You know, I hope we're always improving with the numbers, and we have been. It's been slow, but mm -hmm. we haven't been really been pushing the the Steam page at all. Everything's kind of going into our Kickstarter campaign. When I saw the trailer. I didn't even think it was a Metrovania game. Uh, what captivated me was 
the art style because I have like a, a really fond memories of me playing Okami. So the choice to do of Metroidvania was definitely a risky one just because uh, there's a lot of moving parts to a Metroidvania. It's not like recommended for the first game you make just because of all the interconnectedness of it. Yeah. But I, I found myself not wanting to make any other kind of game. You know, for me, I needed to be motivated to do something that was like, this is a project I'm going to put my heart in over a period of time. And I want it to be what I want it to be. It's going well. We we have the idea for how to do everything and have a vague, vague-ish map drawn out. Everything's subject to change, but... And you mentioned uh, about a Kickstarter. Uh, is there um, any other methods, any other way you and the company are going to market the game? Um, maybe through Twitter, uh, some other form of media? Well, we already have, I don't know if I should say who, but we already have some kind of big YouTube personalities who know about the game and have are on record saying they will stream it and they will, that they're very excited about it and they're asking for beta access already. It's like, we're, we're not at that point yet, but uh, so, so there will be that. I think that, that, I think that is one of the best ways to get your, your game out. Also like these tools like Reddit and Imgur, 9gag. Twitter, of course, uh, even TikTok, which which I don't use and I don't plan to use. For <laughs> if someone else wants to run our TikTok account pro bono, we could talk business. But uh, I'm not touching that. It's just it's it's a lot of stress. I'm too busy. Other than that, uh, we have been in talks with a few publishers. I think when you first start out doing indie dev, like you get flooded with publishers of various quality and various shadiness. There's, there was two in particular that um, contacted us that I was familiar with already. Like I've played the games that they've published. Um, very reputable companies that have approached us about Bo. And publishing companies, for those who don't know, will help with that kind of... They'll do localization. They'll do porting to every the various consoles like Switch. And another thing to help with, obviously, is marketing. So they have these networks of blogs, uh, writers... YouTubers, podcasters, Twitch streamers, everything. And they kind of just take care of that for you. And that kind of would be a dream come true for me. Um, just yeah. not having to do that and just being able to focus on my drawing tablet all day and create. Let your mind unfold. I can manage Twitter perfectly fine. But once it starts stacking like Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, I, it's too much. And, and you get and it can weirdly obsess you. Yeah. Um, if you're not careful, there's an addictive quality to it. So you, you, I find my even on Twitter, I find myself on Twitter too much. Same here. Like get back to Photoshop or Unity. Yeah, like uh, social media definitely has its perks, but at the same time, um, it definitely has an addicting nature to it. Uh, so you you have to like make sure you have time to yourself, to your work, everything else, your friends, your family. It's yeah. very important. You are important to yourself. You have to make sure that you have time to yourself as well. So Bo is a hand-drawn game when it comes to its art style. What made you want to go in this artistic direction? Oh, I think a simple answer to that is I have always been really attracted to hand-drawn stuff. Uh, not only in gaming, but just in general. I love, I grew up on Studio Ghibli movies, Spirited Away, House Moving Castle, Totoro. I grew up on these movies. They've influenced me in ways I'm probably not even aware of. I can like recite Totoro by my memory because I've seen it <laughs> hundreds of times because we watch it every day. Uh, so I'm a lot visually influenced by Studio Ghibli. I love anime, uh, Demon Slayer, Jujutsu Kaisen, older school stuff like Death Note, Dragon Ball Z, all that stuff. And uh, so that's influenced me in a way. I'm half Japanese too, so there's that cultural influence. Mm -hmm. But the hand-drawn art style, it's the game I want to make. Like, I just never was into games like uh, with hyper-realistic graphics. like yeah. uh, Call of Duty? Yeah, yeah, Call of Duty. Any, <laughs> anything with hyper-realistic graphics, with the exception of Mass Effect, because the world they created there was awesome. If you look at my Steam library, it's nothing. It, nothing except Grand Theft Auto V. <laughs> Nothing is like realistic, but even that game is kind of no, stylistically uh, manipulated. No. It's not like hyper realistic. I don't know. It's always attracted to me. I love animation. I love the wackiness you can uh, kind of convey in, a, in an animated character versus something that's a little more uh, hyper realistic. 
Yeah. Uh, and I like uh, cutesy stuff too. I don't know. I always like every time I my illustrations are very cutesy. I've been told that. I, that's not my adjective, but people have called my art cutesy. Those games always appeal to me, so I was like, "This is I gotta make a game like that." Yeah, and um, the visuals are very striking. I love it. I, I love uh, looking at it. So that's definitely a good thing. Uh, I think what's wonderful when it comes to indie games is that, in particular, there's a lot of different types. And also, when the art style, when we're talking art style, uh, there is different variants of art. Also, there's a cell shading type art. There's there's so much you could do when it comes to art, realistic graphics and all that you know how much could you do with it the only thing you could do is just up the resolution make the game look even more realistic than actual life itself that's where indie indie games have an advantage you know you could you could do so much with it so Bo is a game about a tiny fox demon where your earrings are a weapon Bo is based on a Japanese folklore uh, I want to know if you mind tell me more about that in a nutshell that copy is correct but I had to shorten it, kind of. It's a little more complicated than he's a fox demon. <laughs> he's actually like a spirit, like a moon spirit that lands on a budding lotus, and he possesses that lotus. Mm -hmm. And there's also a fox mask inside to kind of give it some personality. Ooh. Um. So he's based off like a, the Kitsune spirit in in uh, Japanese folklore. However, he's kind of our own creation. He's kind of an, a folk tale that we're telling in modern times. So the folk tale of Bo doesn't exist. His creature doesn't exist. It's a creature that I made. Yeah, so our game's enemies and NPCs are, I would say the majority of them are taken from what are called yokai. And yokai are these spirits in Japanese culture mm -hmm. uh, and folklore that are basically like little monsters. If you know Pokemon, Pokemon are kind of based off yokai. Uh, yeah, there's some wacky ones. If you want to like look at, look them up, uh, there's a great website called yokai.com, where this guy it's an he made an encyclopedia of of uh, these yokai, with, complete with illustrations. He does it's amazing. We're using it a lot for the game to research. Yeah, and then in general, there's an overarching a narrative to the game that is involves some very prominent characters in Japanese folklore. However, the story is is not quite, you could think of it as kind of like an untold story of Japanese folklore that uh, that we made up. Whenever uh, a game has something to do with masks, it just kind of reminds me back to Majora's Mask. Ooh. How how like when Link puts on the mask, he turns into that animal, that creature, whatever that is. Yeah, definitely. That game was great. That, oh, totally a unique experience. It, it it's a game that haunts you for years in a in a good way but also kind of a bad way that that game uh was strike it was haunting that's that's the way to that's the way to describe it yeah that game that game inspires me in a way that i don't know either maybe not bow but the, the darkness of that game like the dark aspects of that game always stood out to me and bow's gonna have some darkness too Ooh, nice so how long has the game been in development and has the game gone through any major changes? So the game started, the inception of the idea for Bo was January 2021, this year. Wow. Um, right now it's, what, what month is it? November, so for, <laughs> for your reference, you're watching this video in the future. So, and then there was two months where, where I had to take off because I had to go visit my, or I went to go visit my family in America. Mm -hmm. There was issues with COVID and stuff. So yeah, uh, there was two months taken off there, but, and then, in March, my programmer came on. I was a solo developer at first. My programmer, Trevor Youngquist, came on in March of this year. And then we started hacking away at it. And at first, it was really roughly hewn. We we barely knew. We couldn't even think of a single ability for Bo. It's like, okay, he's going to jump. He's going to probably have a dash of some kind. You know, it's kind of like the beginning stages. We didn't know what the game was going to be. Uh, I had ideas for, like, what the world was going to look like. Mm -hmm. Some of the characters that were going to be involved, but... As far as like from a gameplay standpoint, we were throwing darts at the wall, trying to see what's stuck. We started chugging along more as we started getting more comfortable with Unity. I knew nothing about Unity before this year. I never touched it. I never did any, I never used the program even vaguely similar to Unity. Mm -hmm. I mean, the closest thing maybe I used was Photoshop, but that's like totally not even Oh wow! in the same ballpark. But I was pretty fluid in Photoshop. So that aspect of game 
game dev. I'm lucky I had that because learning both at the same time would have been a roadblock for sure. As we got more comfortable and comfortable with Unity, we, we started uh, naturally falling into this system where we're able to iterate quickly. And we were all we were always building up to this trailer. We like I kind of blocked out the trailer uh, pretty early on, like what I wanted to include, which mechanics I wanted to include, which characters. And that really helped with development, actually, because I had a, I had an idea of what I wanted in the game. So we want to we wanted to show that in the trailer and it pushed you to complete that section of the game. You, you need to start seeing what's appealing about your game and doubling down on that. Once yeah. you're getting data from like feedback on Twitter and stuff, and then polishing that and putting it in the trailer. When players are watching the trailer within the first minute or two, they're like, wow, what is this game? I need to know more about it. Keep exactly. them wanting more. Yeah, I, I mean, a great example of that in the development of Bo was when and just one day I sat down and I was looking at some traditional Japanese art. And you know that there's this famous painting called The Great Wave Off Kanagawa. And it's you definitely know it. It's that uh, tidal wave. It's by Hokusai. It's, it's, a, it's a tidal wave that's just kind of very iconic Japanese painting. And uh, I was like, oh, that, that's cool. How, how would I incorporate that into Bo? You know, we, we kind of are pulling from Japanese traditional art styles a little bit here and there. And I just drew that wave. I had no idea if it was good or not. I'm terrible at judging my own artwork, by the way. You know, people will tell me, oh, your artwork's, yeah, it's great. And I just, I'm like, is it? I guess it's good. If you like it, that's fine. I'm apprehensive about showing my artwork. And I think a lot of artists can relate to that. So I'm not alone. But um, we, we put, I drew that wave and we put it up on Twitter in the scene that I created of him running across the bridge in the auto chase sequence, auto scroller sequence. Mm -hmm. And the response to that was way above any response we had received up until that point. Didn't really uh, expect that. And I didn't really spend too much time on it, but it was the thing that resonated with people. And the point of the story is to say like, you don't know, you don't necessarily as the dev know what people are gonna like, and you don't know what they're gonna respond to. No matter how apprehensive you are, no matter no matter how many like misgivings you have about sharing your art, mm -hmm. you need to. Uh, you need to show early and often. And that's always a mantra in my mind. Show early, show often. You need to see what public is responding to. Because at the end of the day, they are going to be playing your game. It's kind of a collaborative project, especially in this day and age where you can collaborate with your fan base uh, to make the game. And we're doing that in Discord, our Discord, by the way. An artist will be harsh on the work. That's that's how you know that is a good artist right there. And it definitely shows in in the trailer, the teaser trailer for Bo. Like it shows like a lot of good effort went to this game. Uh, I still I still have more to see. I, I want to see more about the game. I'm 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 anticipating more footage when it comes out. Uh, so that's a good sign that the team is really caring for this project soon to be released. So even though I know that you're harsh on your art, that's a good thing because that means you love your art. Video game development can be a tiring process. How do you keep yourself from burning out? I am not, I'm not great at answering that per question in particular because I do burn out and often there, there are literally some days where I'm like, I can't work on this today. Mm -hmm. e even though I really enjoy, I really enjoy some aspects of game dev. There are some aspects that I would rather not deal with. Those things really kind of bring you down, especially when you hit a wall with something you don't know how to do and you're just so frustrated trying to find a solution. Uh, those kind of things can really hold up the development process and I, and I don't like that. I always like to be moving. I like to do the things I'm good at. So if, if, like, if I could just draw like the environments and stuff, that'd be great. Uh, I have to wear so many more hats than just the guy who draws the pictures because I'm I'm directing the game as well. So I have to be really in touch with the programmer. I have to design the game. I have to talk to the, mu the musician, the animator that we have, keeping a steady workflow for them because now I'm their boss. I'm like paying them and I have to be a good, a good leader, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of annoying when I kind of just want to draw pictures. I would say I'm managing it all right. Definitely a lot more hours on my computer this year than ever before. But the burnout is real, and I don't think I have a good answer with how to deal with it. Actually, I might have an answer for it. It's always You always got to keep the goal in mind and set up milestones for yourself. 
our last milestone was getting the trailer out. Our next milestone would be the Kickstarter. So you kind of have to set up these touchstones in the distance that are very clear and kind of excite you in some way. And for me, I, I always need a little bit of that emotion attached to the next milestone. The passion is really what tugs you and uh, gets you up every morning. If your only goal is to ship the game, that's you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. You need to have a hundred goals in between where you are now and when you ship the game. Um, that's the only way you're going to finish it, I, I feel like, and that's helped so much. That is a great answer. I think uh, going back to the drawing boards and just uh, always trying to see what works, what doesn't work, feedback, communicating with the fans and seeing what they're thinking about. To have a, a release date and be like, we got to do this by this time. It's not the right approach. It really isn't. It's too abstract. You need to break everything down into smaller, simpler pieces or shapes. The same with drawing. You, you break down a really complex character into very simple shapes, circles and squares, and it becomes more manageable. Mm -hmm. Like, you feel it's just easier. You, you flow right into it. Um, but it, it's difficult when things are so abstract. Thank you for the answer. I really, I really appreciate it. In the game, you drink arcane tea to unlock both shape-shifting staff abilities. Would you mind explaining more about that? So tea is kind of like a motif that is explored throughout the game because Bo will have this little teapot that he carries with him. It won't be present on his sprite, but you can just imagine it to be in his inventory. And that teapot holds uh, teal tea. And teal tea is a special brew in our, our world of Bo. Mm -hmm. It's a special brew of tea that has magical properties. And it's made from various different like ingredients that are found through different areas in the game. We haven't quite come up with the, the name that's stuck yet, but we're calling it Demon Dust right now. There's that core ingredient, so you, every tea involves using that core ingredient to make. And then there's specialty ingredients that you have to collect in order to make different brews of that teal tea. And depending on which one you drink, you're able to unlock a new ability. So that's how the abil abilities are unlocked. The teapot serves as like a mana bar. As you collect uh, the kitsunebi or the demon dust, the mana bar will fill up and you're able to use your abilities based off the mana as well as heal using the mana as a resource. Do you have any uh, favorite tea in particular? I tend to like oolong tea. And I don't know why, but it's kind of, uh, there's this cafe nearby and they had oolong. They have oolong on the menu. And uh, it just mellows me out. I kind of like it. Very green nice. tea is great too. I love green tea. I like that uh, Oishi, I think. Oishi uh, green tea, like unsweetened. I'm going to have to write some of these down because I am a fan of tea. Uh, I drink the, the usual chamomile. You know, I think that's like the most common one, but I, I love it. So uh, I know we spoke about milestones before. Uh, will there be an art book for the game? And also, uh, is there going to be any merchandise planned with the release of Bo? The art book has been a thing that's kind of been on my mind. Kind of a callback to earlier when I was saying I have so much apprehension about showing my art. Uh, yeah. I would be like, who the heck would want to even... You know, your, your character designs go through so many iterations. And a lot of them, 99.99% .99 of them are garbage. At least from the, the viewpoint of the artist. I know I'm being harsh, but you know that's sometimes how I feel. Um, and that's that's the artistic process, you know. So I'm always like, no one, no one would want to see that. Also, it would be like a lot of work, a lot of extra work. I personally wouldn't be down for, but if someone wanted to like take that project on eventually, and, and there was enough demand for an art book, I would, I would be open to it. As for like merch, we do have a bow plush being prototyped right now. Um, I'm talking with this factory, and they are. They're going through a few design iterations. The first one was not quite right, but I, I, I sent them the alterations recently and they are they're on it. Um, Bo, Bo has some very specific, he kind of has a very spheroid head, what I call neonatal features. He's kind of like, looks baby-ish, big forehead, big ears, rather than like a kind of a cool character babyish although like he has been rendered in some cool ways and i'm looking forward to seeing people's interpretation of him we have some great fan art already 
Uh, but for the doll, I definitely wanted to be a cute doll. If we did like a, a figurine, like a like an anime figurine, you know those ones. Maybe we could do something more on the cool side, uh, appealing side. But for the doll, I just wanted it to look cute, like a chibi figure. What about what about like a Funko Pop? Would you consider trying that? Yeah, I would love to do that. I've I've thought about doing the figure as well. It was actually in the beginning it was either the figure or the plush. Doing both was too much. I did some vote in Discord and most people wanted the plush. So that's why that happened. And also we're thinking of doing a poster. I feel like that's a very economical piece of merchandise. You know, it's it's cheap to produce, but um, people love them. You know, it's a piece of artwork you can hang. I love posters too, as you can see. Going back to what you said about uh, the art book and that you mentioned that, you know, there is... A lot of uh, rough drafts. I like to say rough drafts instead of trash. I don't know. I, I don't want to be harsh on art. But uh, you say, like, who would want to see this? I promise you, Chris, I promise you, there are people out there that are willing to pay money to see what the game was like, despite how it looked. Because people are curious. We are curious beings. Yeah, I mean, if I take a step back out of my own mind and, like, think about a game that I liked, if there was an art book, I would buy that art book. Like, I want to know how they do it. But but somehow, like, when it's about me, it's totally different. I totally understand your, your point of view. I mean, uh, I watched this documentary about Miyazaki, Hayao Miyazaki, the guy who uh, directs most of the Studio Ghibli movies. Mm -hmm. And in this documentary, he's doing all these sketches. And he'll do a sketch and then crumple it up and throw it in the trash. Oh, wow. He, he'll do the most charming little sketch. And you're like, whoa, this is the master at work here and he's uh he was making the movie ponyo at the time and he was drawing the characters and I was like these drawings are priceless like by anyone's definition are priceless and he's tossing them in the trash i don't know i'm not comparing myself to him but like it's very strange phenomenon it probably should be studied by a psychologist you do make sense like i i do understand where you're coming from because bo is your baby you're taking care of it you know you want to make sure that Everyone sees the game in, in its true light. So I, I can understand why you're a little bit hesitant when it comes to the artwork. So uh, name me a few things that makes players not want to buy a game. Uh, microtransactions it seems to be a popular one these days. Personally, hmm, what would make me not buy a game? I don't like the horror genre. Uh, so I guess personal preference is probably a huge one. So I would never buy a horror game. Mm -hmm. I did buy Little Nightmares, but I haven't played it. But I did think it was kind of cool looking. <laughs> um, that's just me. I'm not into that. I don't know. You can kind of tell by the visuals of a game right away. That That's kind of what makes or breaks a game is the visuals. Yeah. So if you can kind of look at it and tell that the uh, the it was an asset flip or that the artist kind of phoned it in or didn't really put the work in for it to be good... Like, I just wouldn't even entertain the thought of buying it. Unless it was, like, highly rated for some reason. A game that I judged really harshly based on the art style was uh, Undertale. You oh, know Undertale, wow. right? Yeah, yeah, I love that game. I mean, yeah, no, it, I'm not knocking that game at all, but I... People judge. I'm not free of judgment. Like, I looked at it and I'm like, why is this game popular? <laughs> it, it's It's pixel art, but... I don't know, not knowing about it and not having any background on it, it's, it, it would be easy to judge as like someone who didn't really know what they were doing with art. But I, w I couldn't be more wrong because the way... I, I don't remember the name of the developer. Sorry, do you, do you know his name? Toby Fox? Toby, yeah. Uh, Toby Fox, yeah. Uh, the way he... It just worked for him. You have to play the game to get it. Yeah. Uh, so the art style didn't necessarily carry that game, but it... It really enhanced the experience in, in some weird way. I, I never tried to articulate it, but... So, never judge a book by its cover is the point. But, but art style is definitely, for me, what makes or breaks a game. Like, I'd say, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna go judge a game, uh, make sure that the criticism that you're talking about matches the demo that you're playing. And uh, take it from there. If you like the demo, then your, your opinions change afterwards. Okay, we have a few more questions left. I just wanted to ask you, are you having fun so far? Uh, with the interview? Yeah. Awesome. I'm so glad. That's I am. great. Yeah, man. 
you 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 ask great questions, like not common questions. So I've had to think a little bit harder than usual. That's what I want to make you do. Every time you come on, I want to make you think. <laughs> Thank you. It helps the mind. Sure. What keeps you going in life? Who who inspires you? I mean, definitely I've always wanted to make my parents proud. Been supportive of my my creativity since I was young. I was the creative kid in our family. I'm a, I had uh, my parents had three kids. I was the only one who had any shred of artistic ability. Mm -hmm. So they really tried to nurture that in me. My dad would, and mom would always buy like uh, any sketchbooks or color pencils and stuff that I needed. A lot of parents would be like, what the hell are you doing? Why are you pursuing art? You know, you need to be studying. You need to be becoming a doctor, lawyer, whatever, you know, the whole shtick. So but, true. Yeah, I, my parents weren't like that. They, they saw that that's what brought me joy and they fed me more of it and gave me all the tools I needed to do that. So I'm definitely grateful to them. They've been, they've just been so such great parents and uh, I owe it to them to do something with my artistic ability. While I, for the longest, like for the past 10 years, I did nothing artistic other than like photography. I did nothing like drawing wise. So Bo has been really like a rebirth for my creativity. I think, I think creativity is one of the most important things for people to pursue. Even if you don't consider yourself an artistic person, creating something is a joy that you can't really get anywhere else in life. So whether that's like building something or working on a project with friends, you need to be creating in your life. That's yeah. the only thing in my life that's ever bought me joy besides like the love from my parents and friends and stuff, I guess. But the only thing that I could really do that brought me joy personally was creating. If I wasn't working on some project or creating something new, I don't know. I don't even know what life would be like because I'm always doing something. Your parents uh, raised you, right? They, they allowed you to have the creative freedom. Uh, that, is, that is true love right there. Being creative is passion. It's the motivational factor in life. Every single day it gets you by. And now you're making Bo. That is definitely inspirational, definitely to a lot of other indie game developers as well. For the longest time, we were inspired by other indie indie developers, and like, there comes a point in development where like people start to become inspired by you, and it kind of blows your mind. Like, what did I become inspiring? When did that happen, and why? <laughs> it's a cool feeling, but you do feel like this responsibility that wasn't quite there before. That that kind of leads me to my next question: Is there any message you would like to say to up and coming developers? To quote Shia LaBeouf and Nike, just do it. The The conditions will never be perfect. If you truly want to be a game dev, you have to jump into it and start making your first game. There can be no excuses. For the longest time I had I had the excuses. I still have some excuses for not, not working on both sometimes. Once you begin, it becomes exponentially easier to continue. The amount of hardship you feel in the beginning, obstacles you hit, start to become more few and far between. That's, that's what we're made for. We're made for learning and improving. Mm -hmm. So it's going to feel hard at first. You're going to feel like, well, I, actually, I'm not made for this. I, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an imposter. You just got to do it every day. And little by little, it just becomes easier and easier until you're, you're cruising. And um, there'll, be, there'll be a bumpy road ahead, but you got to step out your front door first. And, and just do it. I feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing right now. One of my goals in life was to create a video game and I'm finally doing it, you know? So it feels good. Definitely, Great. this this is your calling. Um, I've, I've interviewed about maybe six or seven people so far. And I ask this question most of the time and every single time I just get a wonderful answer, especially yours. When you have the drive, when you have the motivation, you're you're helping yourself create something much more than life. You are inspiring others in the process. People might not know that, but you are. I, I don't think I would have been able to do it if it wasn't for the great feedback from people. You only have so much energy you can expend yourself, but the people who respond well to your game and give you positivity, that your energy tank magically becomes more full and I'm able to keep going. So it's, it's not really not me. I can't say that it's me. 
I'm not doing this without the help of everyone who has ever said a good thing about the game and, and has has uh, shown some sort of positive emotion towards the game. That's pushed me in a way I can't even describe. You are a very humble person. You get bonus points for, for being that. <laughs> I, I like true, that about though. you. It's I like, like that about you. It's like so true. I, I don't know what, what's going on. It's just like uh, I'm experiencing a lot of new things through game dev. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the new things I'm really experiencing. One thing that I'm sure of is I'm putting my passion into the game. If you put passion into something, people are attracted to that. People are attracted to passion and uh, will see that you're putting that work in there. If you're truly doing it and it's truly coming from a, a sincere place, people are naturally attracted to that. So that's kind of been a metric for how I measure if I'm doing well or not. The fans, the players, just they just know. They're attracted. They know what is up, what is down, what is something you want to buy, what is something you want to avoid when it comes to gaming. Yeah, the players are smart, man. Don't mess with the they players. Know, <laughs> yeah, there's, they know what they want. Yeah, they know you better than you know yourself sometimes. <laughs> what is your top five favorite games of all time? I'm an N64 boy. I grew up on... My first console was N64. The first game I ever beat was Pokemon Red. The memories I have of that game are irreplaceable. Uh, the bonds you make from your friends who also play the game and who are obsessed with Pokemon. How old are you, by the way? I'm 31. Oh, I'm 31 too. Also, so we grew up. We grew up at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're too old to be doing this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> like that uh, um, YouTube troll that told me that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little callback. Uh, so yeah, you you grew up with Pokemon. You remember the Pokemon craze, like that. I have so many good memories of Pokemon. Well, okay, Pokemon. I actually I prefer Pokemon Yellow and, uh, sorry, Silver and Gold over Red and Blue. But red has like a little special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, N64, we got Ocarina of Time. Wow. That game blew my mind. That game blew <laughs> the whole generation's mind. But I really love that game. My friend gave it to me. Actually, I didn't even have to buy it. Awesome. Uh, Free game. Banjo, Banjo Tui. Not Banjo Kazooie, because I actually didn't play Banjo Kazooie until years later. Um, but I had an actual cartridge for Banjo Tui. And, and that game blew me away with like how big some of the worlds were and how wacky the characters were you might see some influences uh in in bow if you're really keen uh, of like how i was influenced by the banjo kazooie series very nice uh not nuts and bolts but like you know the, <laughs> the good ones on n64 paper mario 64 Ooh. that game i've played probably the most out of any n64 game Again, it was about the characters uh, and the, the little mysteries you find. Uh, you, you know, you hit a tree, something cool pops out. Oh, what's behind this hidden door? And just all the colorful scenery in that. I mean, the, the inspiration in Bo, I think, is a little more obvious than the banjo. But Very nice. Uh, I, I love the art style of Paper Mario 2. Okay, I'm going to say Hollow Knight. I feel like that's obvious. Uh, but Hollow Knight... For all the same reasons, the characters, the the consistent art style, the, the the brilliant soundtrack on that game, I I actually really like insects too. You can kind of see I have like a beetle here, oh like wow. a Hercules beetle. Yeah. So I've always liked insects. So that was another cool thing that I loved about uh, Hollow Knight. A weird one that I like that people might not expect is Into the Breach. So that's a turn based turn based kind of like. Roguelike. Ro roguelike, yeah. <laughs> yeah, turn-based strategic roguelike game by the people who did Faster Than Light. And it's just, the replayability of that game is amazing. And the way they, uh, just the des the game design is like a masterclass for strategy games. And uh, maybe was a, maybe one more. Um, I had I had it, and then I forgot what it was. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, I remember the game was. It was League yes. of Legends. League of Legends, wow. Yeah. So I, you know, that game is by far. Far, I don't know how I forgot about it, but that game is by far the most hours logged for me. I mean, I haven't played it since I started developing Bo, or I would never have developed Bo. <laughs> uh, but I, I love that game. That game is great. The community could be a bit rough, but... I've heard. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, everyone. Give it up for Chris. He is the creative director, lead artist for the upcoming game Bo, releasing on Steam and Nintendo Switch. 
Now, uh, I want to know, will the game be on other platforms? I want it to. I want it to be. Um, right now, I think Switch is a great, a great home for Bo. Mm -hmm. So that was one we, we definitely want to do. But as for the other, ga other consoles, it's quite a process to get your game ported. If we decide to go with the publisher and they uh, handle it all for us, then yes, it will be on all consoles. But right now, as, as a small indie team, we can only do so much. So yeah. PC first, Switch first, and then we'll see. We'll take it from there. Does the game have its own Patreon page? We don't. That's another thing that like I've, is in the back of my mind, but seems a little too complicated to get into right now. It's okay. Are there ways for people to reach out to the studio through social media to support the game? We are pretty active, and by we, I mean me. <laughs> I'm pretty active on Twitter. So if you DM me, I, I most likely will see it. Sometimes it gets buried. The best way, like, we are, at, I'm in the Discord every day. So our Discord server, uh, our Discord server is linked on our Twitter mm -hmm. in our link tree, okay. but also in the bio. So joining that, I, you're, you're part of our Discord server. That's why I wanted to... You're one of like the early, early dudes in our server. And I love being there. Yeah. So uh, I, I definitely, that's one reason I really wanted to give you, give you an interview if you were down. Thank you. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. You got to support the day ones, you know, like they, you, you, I forgot. Yeah. You're the one who's inspiring me. You're one of those people that I was talking about before. So thank thanks you. For that. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm going to cry right now. <laughs> oh no. It's, I mean, it's nothing to cry about. All good vibes. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I really appreciate yeah. the compliment. Yeah, I'm pretty responsive in the Discord, uh, you know, when I can be. Sometimes I, I shut it off because you never really get anything done if you're always on Discord. You know, that's about it, Twitter and Discord, the best ways. I'll definitely be uh, posting the, the name, the handle of the Twitter and the links in the description so people can uh, click on it and, and find you and talk to you about the game and, and just give their feedback on it because feedback is super important nowadays, you know? It's always been. Awesome. A playable demo for Bo will be available on February 1st, 2022. Check out the teaser trailer for more information. Is there anything you'd like to say before we end this interview? Thank you for having me. Uh, great questions. If you ever want to talk again, a little bit further in the future since we just talked, but uh, I'm happy to do it. Thank you for being a part of this. This was a great experience, and I'm so happy I got to know more about you. It was a pleasure doing this interview. My name is Spirit, and I thank you all for tuning in. I hope you all have a great day.